dance. This right. is uh, about the last meeting. Good evening. I'll call this meeting of the Bowling City Council to order here at 6.01 p.m. in council chambers. Uh, we have no remote electronic attendance, no, correct? Um, and you'll note the board appointments. These are reappointments to the Youth Commission and the Historic Preservation Commission. And we'll, so we'll start then with our presentations. Top cop award to Officer Cody Parman. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good evening, Council. Uh, thank you for letting me come before you today. I wanted, I know you probably saw the press release that we put out. This has already been uh, disseminated to the media and the public, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to meet Officer Parmenter uh, in person, uh, an outstanding officer, an outstanding representation of the police department, uh, and I think somebody you can be proud of serving <laughs> on our police department and uh, our community. Last year, about midway of last year, the uh, Breakfast Optimist Club approached me and the police chief in East Moline and asked if we'd be interested in doing an Officer of the Year uh, program that they were putting together. Uh, we put our heads together. Uh, they had some uh, rough uh, outlines to it, but ultimately they formed a uh, independent committee, uh, no input from, from us other than the nominations, uh, and they received nominations from both Moline and East Moline for outstanding achievement and awards uh, that the uh, police department thought should be considered uh, by the Optimists. And it, those of you that know the Optimist Club, they're founded in 1919 and they do work in their communities to promote good government, promote the military and patriotism and support local youth. Uh, they're also well known for that Avenue of the Flags project you often see during holidays where they put the, uh, the American flags out on the streets. Um, so they uh, designed this program to give uh, an officer of the year and a top cop given to an individual police officer who in the opinion of the selection committee was worthy of recognition for accomplishments and their work in the previous year. The Optimist Committee members judge applicants based on heroism, community service, meritorious performance, and club purpose. Uh, applications were solicited, as I said, from the Moline and East Moline Police Departments and the committee reviewed nine nominations and selected four finalists, two officers of the year, and one from each city. Uh, the committee then ultimately chose one of those officers of the year to be honored as a top cop. Uh, the committee chose uh, Sergeant William Lynn from the East Moline Police Department as the officer of the year from East Moline, and Officer Cody Parmenter uh, from the Moline Police Department as the officer of the year from Moline. And then ultimately, I'm proud to say that Cody Parmenter was awarded the top cop uh, for the, the 2021 year. So to give you a background on the nomination, he was nominated by his division lieutenant, Derek Coulson, who said that uh, Officer Cody Parmenter should be nominated for improving the safety and quality of life in our community, building community trust and collaboration, and enhancing the professionalism, teamwork, integrity of the department. And those are goals that I set forth at the beginning of the year uh, for, the, for all the divisions to try to achieve. And Lieutenant Coulson uh, noted that Officer Parmenter made over 45 felony arrests, mostly for the delivery or possession of methamphetamine or other controlled substances, made additional 25 arrests for driving under the influence. And he made several arrests for gun crimes, unlawful use of weapon, and armed violence. Furthermore, and I think this is a really cool thing, you may have seen this on our Facebook page, Officer Parmenter developed a community-oriented policing program to emphasize the importance of staying in school and being a productive member of our community. And this is difficult for somebody on third shift to do, if you've ever worked shift work, <laughs> to then you know, motivate yourself to get up and do stuff during the day is, a, is another uh, piece of motivation. Um, but this program strives to build and strengthen the relationship between children in the community and the Moline Police Department by recognizing students for their outstanding achievements and police visiting them at school for a pizza party. Uh, so Officer Parmenter was also awarded a life-saving award for his actions on March 15th. 2021 when he saved the life of a citizen inside a burning house fire. So I wanted to uh, bring uh, Cody in front of you today to just reintroduce you. I mean, you may have seen him at a swearing in. He's a fairly new officer. I'm certainly very proud of Cody. Um, he recently was selected amongst a very competitive application pro process for a position in our crime prevention unit. So he will actually be going to days to do even more great work in our community events team and around, uh, around town this time during the day. So we'll see what he can do uh, for you uh, on a more normal sh schedule. And I, his wife, Megan, is here, and they're two young boys. So if you wouldn't mind, I don't have any additional awards to give him, but if, you, if I could just bring him forward. 
and uh, maybe you could give him a round of applause if you so see fit. So, Cody. I won't put you on the spot to make a speech, but maybe you want to bring your family up and we'll take a, a photo here. With you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think he may have been one of the officers that probably has one of these uh, these COVID photos of getting sworn in with masks. <laughs> <laughs> so wanted to stand there and horseshoe and get a nice little fireplace mantle. <laughs> <laughs> fire. Much. Okay, our next presentation is the 2022 Cape Moline Beautiful Commission City of Moline Superhero Award Awards. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you all, City Council. It's been a, a few years since we've been here in front of you of most of our programs. Obviously, you're very socially um, require that social interaction, so they've kind of been put on pause, and so we're so happy to be here this evening to present this year's recipients for our Superhero Award. Uh, the, uh, the award is given out to, to uh, individuals, groups, and businesses, it's open to individuals, groups, and businesses, that have gone above and beyond in their efforts to recycle, reuse, repurpose materials, also for cleanup and beautification efforts. And so we have two recipients this year, <coughs> and uh, the first uh, award is going to be presented by our Commissioner Pam Wilson, and the second will be presented by Sue Ratkowitz. So can you come up? All of you. Um, Shirley Morton is um, truly a superhero, and I'm going to give you just a little bit of a, a glimpse of why we nominated her and why she is going to receive this award tonight. So Shirley devoted is devoted to environmental causes um, since she became a resident of Moline over 40 years ago. So she was really recycling before recycling was even cool. Um, <laughs> And, and well before any of the Illinois Quad Cities had established any recycling programs whatsoever. Her and her family set up separate garbage cans in their garage for glass and plastic and paper and magazine paper and, and all sorts of things way back 40 years ago. And um, they, so they had all these garbage cans in their garage and, and they would just sort and then take themselves, because we really didn't have recycling centers back then, they would sort uh, sort the trash and take it to the Rock Island, which was the only recycling center at that time. Her roadside litter collection started decades ago when she started picking up unflattened cans for a friend of hers who was looking for some additional revenue. So unflattened cans um, could be taken over to Davenport for the, the five percent or the five cents or, or whatever um, refund. So that's how she started recycling, and um, it just kind of evolved uh, from there. Um, now she is an icon along Moline's 12th Avenue. She um, almost almost daily when she's in town and not traveling, um, she will walk 12th Avenue uh, from 30th Avenue in Moline at Kennedy Drive's intersection clear to 27th Street at 12th Avenue in Moline. It's a five mile route. She does it nearly daily. Um, she told me just the other day that on a good day, if she wasn't recycling, it would take her about an hour, 15 minutes, hour, 20 minutes. With the picking up of the trash along that five mile route, it takes her over two hours. And she does that almost daily. So, um, she does have, um, she stops along the way. There is a couple of uh, litter recycler or litter bins along the way that she'll drop her bags of trash into as she goes, but um, two hours in a day is pretty remarkable. She picks up anywhere between one and five bags of trash daily. Um, she says it's the, the single-use drinking containers are the biggest culprits. Of course, masks recently, but nicotine products are also a big uh, part of that collection process. Um, she sees an uptick uptick in the litter collection during the school year. Students seem to be notorious for just throwing the trash away. 
Um, Shirley told me a story that one day she was out picking up trash and some woman just rolled down her window and threw out a whole sack of like her, you know, fast food trash just right in front of Shirley, thinking that was her only job was to just pick up whatever they threw on the ground. <laughs> so, um, but in addition to, to the picking up trash, one of Shirley's biggest um, accomplishments is being a role model. She talks to a lot of the kids al along the route, um, particularly at the Wilson um, Junior High School. Middle school, yeah. And um, she gets into some great conversations with these youths and has really had some influence over um, how they're viewing what they can do uh, and what they shouldn't be doing uh, for their community. So um, some of the students have uh, modeled her example and organized their own trash collection um, at different times. So um, last year, Shirley collected $116 in bills and change, but um, <laughs> so that is her really only uh, incentive <laughs> other than to help the, the environment. Um, so in addition to um, Shirley's trash pickup along 12th Avenue, um, she has some other um, important accomplishments. She is the recipient of the Moline's Adopt a Street program, uh, one of her, her neighbors, uh, nominated her for that. Um, she also is a certified dive instructor, so not only does she pick up trash here in the Quad Cities, but as she goes on her diving expeditions um, <laughs> around the world, she uh, helps clean up our oceans as well from the trash deposited there. Um, and then the scope of her efforts um, go beyond even that. Um, she tracks bluebirds that flock to the, uh, her heated bird bath in, in February. She attracts and feeds hummingbirds throughout the summer. She fosters monarchs, um, growing milkweed, from milkweed and then harvesting and sharing the seeds uh, with other monarch advocates. Um, last year, Shirley successfully released 150 mo monarchs. So, um, so anyway, that is my little summary of what Shirley does. Um, she also, she's very active in her church and makes some prayer shawls and uh, hats and scarves for her <coughs> children as well. But. Um, Shirley, thank you so much for all your work and for being such a wonderful role model and advocate for the environment of the Quad Cities. And here is your award. Just a big thank you. If people wouldn't litter, I wouldn't have a job. <laughs> <laughs> is the chief guardian of Keep Moline Beautiful Garden, Keep Moline Beautiful's Garden Guardian Program, where volunteers adopt one of 17 gardens along the Van Butterworth Parkway. For years, when Mary walked by the river, she was motivated by her love of gardening to spiff up the existing gardens by pulling weeds and deadheading. She realized that tending to the parkway's many gardens would take more than her time allowed, even though her friends know her as the Energizer Bunny. As a volunteer of the newly formed Keep Moline Beautiful Commission in 2008, she spearheaded the development of Garden Guardians, participants who assist in the beautification of specific gardens along the parkway. Each year, in addition to organizing the volunteers, Mary assists with plant selection, garden design, plant care information, and any other gardening related questions. She regularly updates the volunteers about information pertinent to the gardens as well as offering encouragement to the gardeners. As one of the volunteers stated at the end of last year's gardening season, thank you, Mary, for your leadership with the gardens. Your timely messages, advice, plant suggestions, and purchases go a long way in keeping us informed and motivated. We couldn't do it without you. Passersby passers regularly comment on the beauty of the gardens and their appreciation for the volunteers who tend them. Mary often comments about making plants happy by taking proper care of them. Thanks to Mary's guidance, the Ben Butterworth Parkway Gardens are a happier place for all. Congratulations and thank you.
thank you all. Um, I just wanted to say that it's my firm belief that citizens of any community are looking for a way to give back and make that place a more beautiful, comfortable, safe, and healthy place to live. And through this commission, I've had the opportunity to give people an organized way to give back to Moline. I couldn't do it without the great support of the city and the public works people who support me. Thank you. And one more presentation, the 2022 Water Art Contest winner announcement, Mr. Lodi. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, I have a couple new members of Team Moline, relatively new members of Team Moline I want to introduce you to. Uh, Charlie Brown, he's a microbiologist, is now managing our laboratory. He's been with us for about six months, and he has managed our consumer confidence report and art contest. And then uh, this is Misty. And Misty, uh, while I cannot reveal her true identity, uh, I can tell you that she has a long lineage of history within Moline. Okay, and so Charlie's going to uh, talk to you about our art. So every hour, every day, all year long, the water department works very hard to bring the city clean, safe, fresh tasting water. They do that so that when you need it, the water is there. So it's there when you need it. This year, the water department asked the third graders of Moline to help embody this concept in the form of art. We were able to get 10 schools to participate in our art contest. Uh, each art class uh, chose a winner, and then a school chose a winner from those art class winners, and finally we had a citywide winner chosen from the schools. This year's winner comes from Ms. Kayla Reed's art class at Hamilton Elementary, and this year's winner is Ms. Genevieve Witt. As you can see, her art depicts uh, a family cooling off at the pool, uh, much when we feel like we might need water the most, or uh, and that would be in the heat of summer. Uh, what uh, Genevieve's art will be displayed along with the other top school winners here at City Hall for a couple weeks, and it will just be displayed at the library for a couple weeks for the whole community to enjoy. Um, <clears throat> and then we're sure art will actually be entered into the national uh, contest. So if you would uh, join me in congratulating Ms. Genevieve Witt and her parents, Andrew Witt and Jessica Witt, in her uh, fine uh, excellence in art. Yeah, they blew out, man. They won't be in any trouble.
Okay. <laughs> the next item on our agenda are pro proclamations. We have several. First, from a proclamation from the Abate of Illinois, Inc., to declare May 2022 as Motorcycle Awareness Month. So the proclamation reads, whereas safety is the highest priority on the highways and streets of our city and the state, and whereas the great state of Illinois is proud to be a national leader in motorcycle safety, education, and awareness, and whereas the members of Abate Illinois, Inc., a brotherhood aimed toward education, continually promote motorcycle safety, education, and awareness in high school drivers' ed education programs and to the general public in our city and state, presenting motorcycle awareness programs to over 120,000 participants in Illinois over the past seven years. And whereas during the month of May, all roadway users shall unite in the safe sharing of roadways within Moline and the state of Illinois. Now, therefore, I, Sangeetha Rayapati, mayor of Moline in the great state of Illinois in recognition of 35 years of Abate Illinois Inc. and over 352,318 registered motorcyclists statewide and in recognition of the continued role Illinois serves as a leader in motorcycle safety, education, and awareness, do hereby proclaim May 2022 as Motorcycle Awareness Month. Do we have a representative? Great, come to the podium, please. To say thank you, mm -hmm. and everybody please be safe and watch for us. Or <laughs> we're hard to see, I know, <laughs> but we try our best. Mm -hmm. That's about it, really. Great. What's your name again? Jim. Thank you so much for being here. We'll send you the official um, All right. proclamations yep. All right. very Thank shortly. You. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Second proclamation is uh, Drinking Water Week from American Water Works Association. Uh, whereas water is our most valuable natural resource, and whereas only tap water delivers public health protection, fire protection, support for our economy, and the quality of life we enjoy, and whereas uh, we are all stewards of the water infrastructure upon which future generations depend, and whereas each resident of the city of Moline is called upon to help protect our source waters from pollution, to practice water conservation, and to become involved in local water issues, by learning about this valuable resource. Now, therefore, I, Sangeetha Rayapati, Mayor of Moline, do hereby proclaim May 1 through 7, 2022, as Drinking Water Week. Mr. Lodi. Your Honor, two things real quick. One, I think it's very ironic that Genevieve happened to, uh, to frame her photo about um, a swimming pool when we, uh, as the city, have chosen this year to make such a, a tremendous investment in aquatics. Uh, and then number two, the theme of the contest is there when you need it. And, and so we as water professionals believe that, uh, that our consumers take our product for granted. They expect it to be there. And, and we, um, we realize that we're working behind the scenes and, and um, we are a vital part of the vitality of the community. So thank you so much. Thank you. And our last proclamation today is it requested by Joe Kulimbeck, Assistant Public Works Director, to proclaim the month of May 2022 as Public Safe, or excuse me, Building Safety Month. And the proclamation reads, whereas the city of Moline is committed to recognizing that our growth and strength depends on the safety and essential role our homes, buildings, and infrastructure play, both in everyday life and when disasters strike. And whereas Building Safety Month is sponsored by the International Code Council, to remind the public about the critical role of our community's largely unknown protectors of public safety, our local code officials, who assure us of safe, sustainable, and affordable buildings that are essential to our prosperity. And whereas Safety for All Building Codes in Action, the theme for Building Safety Month 2022, encourages us all to raise awareness about planning for safe and sustainable construction, career opportunities in building safety, understanding disaster mitigation, energy conservation, and creating a safe and abundant water supply to all of our benefit. And whereas each year in observance of Building Safety Month, people all over the world are asked to consider the commitment to improve building safety, resilience, and economic investment at home and in the community, and to acknowledge the essential service provided to all of us by local and state buildings. Now, therefore, Sangi I, Sangeetha Rayapati, Mayor of Moline, do hereby proclaim the month of May 2022 as Building Safety Month. 
Accordingly, I encourage our citizens to join us as we participate in Building Safety Month activities. Mr. Kuluga. Thank you, Your Honor, Council. Just want to uh, say thanks for the recognition and the partnership that we build through the community. It really is a true partnership from developer to owner uh, to our many tradespeople out there every day con constructing and your many municipal partners on the backside uh, ensuring safety. It is a partnership. We work hard to, to foster that. And, and this recognition is a, a big step for that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any public comment this evening? Do not see any. So we shall move uh, questions on the agenda. Seeing none, we'll move to the uh, cow agenda items. The first one is an ordinance amending chapter 34, water and sewers, the Moline Code of Ordinances, section 34-4100. Purpose intent, section 34-4201, drainage permits, and section 34-4203, detention system criteria by repealing said sections in their entirety and enacting in lieu thereof new sections 34-4100, 34-4201, and 34-4203 dealing with the same subject matter. Move to approve. Second. Motion to approve by Alderman O'Brien, seconded by Alderman Wendt. Discussion? Yes, Mr. Wendt. Yeah, I, I just want to thank the uh, Andy and the group for, for uh, making this update, um, but I did want to uh, comment that the last week we had uh, taken a vote to do additional uh, changes to the stormwater regarding <laughs> development, uh, and so uh, hopefully that'll be coming up. I, I know it, it was mentioned that we were going to be talking about this. I, I was like, oh, maybe it'll be incorporated with it, but... Yeah, so sometime in the near future. Do you guys have a time frame for that? Uh, I would guess within the next month or so. Okay, all right, thank you. But thank you. this is a good first start. Mr. Schmidt. Um, I had a couple questions for, just for information. Um, I love the, the, the changes and the recommendation makes total sense on going from the five-year report to how we're changing that for the annual report by the staff. I, I love the way that's formulated. We spend the time doing the work instead of chasing after people to do the work. I mean, yes. Wonderful. Um, as we talk about those larger reports um, with the professional engineers, is there any, how often is that typically going to be required, do we think? Is it going to be less than five years? Is five years about right, but sometimes it'll stretch to six or seven? How is that going to change for those businesses? Class two permits are driven by the size of the development. And uh, I'm going to put a challenge out to our economic development department and say that if we can, you know, get ramp up economic development, then there'll be much many more of those class two permits. But as things stand now, I, I hope I'm answering your question. There's there's really only been like one or two per year for the last two or three or four years. So I meant as when we do that inspection, how frequently do we expect any given pond uh, oh, to require a engineering we, report we will inspect them annually the intent is that we would inspect all of them annually and then when it comes time for the five year we would waive the requirement for the five year if we feel as staff that the the detention pond is in good working condition and i guess my question how long do we think that usually would take them between it just it depends <laughs> on the, the circumstances okay. how much uh, debris is coming into it how how well the sure. owner is maintaining the vegetation and so forth that makes sense. Mr. Wine? Yeah, but overall, you think that's going to reduce the, the, the number and the frequency of it? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Thank this you. This pro development. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing, oh, oh Mr. Sorry. Schmidt. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'd just like to make a motion to remove from that section B regarding those engineer reports to delete the last sentence where it says an annual report is not required the year the five-year report is due. And I'm making that motion because we're no longer having five-year reports. So as but, you proposed, does the language read that we would still uh, have the authority to require a report yes, periodically? Yes. Is that the intent? Where it says at, at the at the request of city staff, the basin should be inspected by a professional engineer 
registered in the state of Illinois. A report of this inspection shall be submitted to the city engineer. Um, the inspection shall include, it used to say at five year intervals, the basin shall be inspected by. And then the last sentence was just an annual report is not required the year, the five year report is due. Understood. Second. Right. Um, amendment has been motioned and it's seconded first by Alderman Schmidt, second by Alderman Timian. Discussion? Mr. Oh, section B. But isn't that report now being done by city staff? There is no longer a five year report. The five year report is being replaced by a as requested by city hall report. So they're waiving a, uh, they used to waive the annual when a five year was done. Now the only time we would do that level of engineering report would be after the city report has already been completed. That's correct. Right? Okay. All right. No, that makes sense. I, th I think it was just a clean up thing. Any further comments? Hearing none, all in favor of the amendment? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The amendment passes. So we're back to the original ordinance update. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion passes. Thank you. Yep. Moving to 1.2, an ordinance amending Chapter 20, Motor Vehicle and Traffic of the Moline Code of Ordinances, Appendix 10. There are parking prohibited at any time by including 36th Avenue on the north side for a distance of 40 feet east of the stop sign at 41st Street. Nick, did you want to summarize? We missed that in the last. <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah, I know. That's all right. <clears throat> I mean, the overview is pretty clear. Okay. Our, our traffic engineering committee is basically making that recommendation based on a meeting they held on March 1st. Moved to approve. Second. Second. Oh, whoa. <laughs> Alderman O'Brien, motion, second by Alderman Waldron. Uh, discussion. Just just one thing, Your Honor. Uh, we're notifying the residents, right? I mean, did, no, did the residents get notified when we... Yes, I caught uh, the gentleman on Saturday. Uh, I couldn't catch him during the week, but I did catch the gentleman on Saturday. Okay. Because I've been getting cars <coughs> on... And, you know, we're... If the street is a certain distance across, you're taking away the parking on one side because right. it's not wide enough to do that. And I've been getting calls from people that maybe they've tried to notify them and they weren't home or whatever. But well, I actually caught him at home in this case. Well, this is this is not this. Oh, it's something okay. else. But there's other parts of the city where they're removing the parking for, for good reasons. I'm not saying it's the wrong reason. I just would like to make sure the residents get notified of what's going on. You know, they see a sign going up, and it's like, call your alderman. Yes, you know. And I agree. They, they should be notified <laughs> right. prior to the sign. Yeah, no. As Thank a, you, Mr. I can Brian. answer that as well. As a general rule, given what happened here many months ago, when there were two streets uh, that were proposed, and this council voted unanimously on both of those uh, relocations of the no parking signs, voted unanimously on both cases to uh, shut that down. Uh, that was the learning lesson, and yes, residents are notified as we are moving forward from that day for from that day in time. Okay. Thank you, Mr. White. Yeah, and, and two things. Actually, I hope they're getting notified before the spray goes out and the flags. Because that's usually when we start getting. Yeah. Get that's, when you get so, that's when yes. you get your phone calls. Yes. Uh, the second thing is, and, and, and this is fine, <laughs> but moving forward in the future, historically, we've always got a diagram and a picture like an aerial of these changes that did not get attached i i don't think that it was in the thing. that that was an oversight okay it, it just because i mean it's fine you know go into google earth and you kind of work your way around but sometimes hmm. okay there was okay. one developed for that okay. for that okay uh, thank item. you thanks any further discussion hearing none all in favor aye, aye. any opposed motion passes 1.3, an ordinance amending Chapter 2, Motor Vehicles and Traffic of the Moline Code of Ordinances, Appendix 4, there are three-way stop intersections by adding the intersection of 35th Avenue and 14th Street. Move to approve. Second. Motion by Alderman Timian, seconded by Alderman Wendt. Discussion. <laughs> Mr. Timian. I just want to thank you, uh, the Traffic Committee for this. This is on uh, a frequent r route of mine, riding, and it is a blind corner on a fairly steep hill. So it's it's a really good addition just for all around safety. Thank you. 
Mr. White. Yeah, and I want to add it's at the end of my street, and uh, <laughs> it, we used to call that Danger Hill. Yes. It's a little bit better than it used to be, but uh, um, it is, uh, for a myriad of reasons, it's a, it's a, it's a good one. So, thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion passes. Moving to our informational, Mr. Vitas, on sure. the strategic plan, action plan, quarter one report. Sure. Very good, Mayor. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Council, for this opportunity to just kind of review where we're at. Uh, as you know, back in February, first week, we released the, the initial action plan. And in that action plan, all 85 of your strategic goals were identified, laid out in task format. And then what we did is we created a dashboard. If you look back then, you'll see that there were a lot of red lights, right? Because we were just issuing it when we were launching programs here in the city. Um, going forward, at the end at the end of the first quarter, meaning the end of March, uh, staff directors and their staffs work, staff staff worked uh, together with my office and with Macy in particular to actually start to go through those and to update those based upon you know where we are today across the board on all of the specific strategic uh, goal projects and programs that needed to be launched. Some of them, of course, won't be launched until next fiscal year. And of course, those are going to stay red unless for some reason they should move up. But for the moment right now, uh, given the funding and given where we're at, uh, the, uh, the action plan as well as the dashboard are accurate as of the release for this uh, particular meeting tonight. So I would expect they will change. Some <laughs> things have been completed. As you can see, they turned, uh, they, they went to a full blue light. Some things remain red. I have not started yet, but for the most part, I think staff has done a great job of actually launching the uh, strategic objective uh, goals that were approved by council and as really based on citizen input last summer. So I'm, I'm happy with the end result. I think we're, uh, we're on target moving forward with uh, many of our projects. There are very few, if any, that are, that are behind or on hold. Um, again, it's, uh, it's a new tool there's a learning curve happening here, and uh, we'll be looking to refine it as we go forward in future years. But for right now, this is our tracking mechanism. And in addition to this, of course, the other tracking mechanism is the, the monthly status and information report, which speaks to a lot of the items that are inside the action plan, but then speak to items that are not even in the action plan or not even a strategic goal. And that's going to be released as well. Uh, next second one will be released next month. Okay. Beginning of the month. Any it's questions? due Friday. Questions? Yes, Any questions? questions? Yeah, yeah. For, for Miriam, out is <clears throat> next month's work session strategic planning. So it's going to be talking about where we're at, where we're headed. Okay, so we're, we're, yep. that's when we'll get into the more Nitty of the and then the things that and were like, direction but weren't on. Uh -huh. I'm, I've suggested that unfinished business. Um, be a part of our discussion for how is it going to fit in? Where are we at getting, how how are we working? We're, we're already working with Macy to work through the lists that have been shared to see like what ways we can prioritize them, et cetera. Because it's, it's, there's a lot there. So it's part of the three-legged stool that we have to discuss on May 17th. So it will, it will be brought, what can I answer? It, it will be brought forward. Um, staff has been working on it diligently not only to determine uh, which of these are directives and when they might have occurred. Some of them we just can't find. I'll be honest with you, we can't find them. But they're still here, and they're not going away just because we can't find them. Uh, the staff does have a comprehensive list. We've done, we've done our deep dive. We have the list. It's been shared with the executive directors. Uh, they are reviewing it. They're identifying where they're at on some of these. Are they on hold? Did they never, was it never uh, addressed? But we are going through carefully, methodically, to ensure that each and every directive that came from council, not only this one, but the previous council, are on this list. So it would, would you be, be able to share that with us as well? That's what you gave us this in different form. Based on, it's in a different format, but it's based on a lot of information you shared with me. I'm, it's not complete. I'm waiting to get the oh. input from the executive directors. Okay. Once I have that, then I'm going to pass. Then I, then I will distribute. Thank you. It's a work in progress. And so you want any updates 
that we might have on the, the dashboard or comments or whatever. If you could send those to me and copy Macy, that would be great. Because okay. Between the two of us, we're always working on it. Perfect. Thanks. Thank You're you. welcome. Our other informational uh, is um, about amending Chapter 4, Alcoholic Liquor, for the Mulling Code of Ordinances. Uh, I mentioned in my multiple emails this over the week, and uh, apologies for so many, but that we do have quite a few executive items. So our our discussion had been, Ms. Gustavos, that we would, since this is a pretty focused conversation on what you've provided, if we use 45 minutes or so, maybe by 7.30, then we, we will stop there and move, uh, bring things back because we're taking chips away at the discussion as we go on this particular chapter. Is that clear to everyone? Okay. Thank you. All right. So as you recall, we provided you uh, last month <clears throat> with a memo with suggestions to um, amend Chapter 4 beyond update. So uh, we talked about single uh, serve last time. Uh, we thought we would focus tonight on uh, reducing the number and, and description of the license classification. Um, uh, so in our memo of last month, we uh, not only did a survey of other communities and the overall number of licensed classes that they had, but we made some general recommendations as to uh, collapsing some of yours into one or just a few and addressing those special uh, licenses or special event licenses. And then from our memo, Janine did further work um, and uh, looked at it from administratively what was her experience um, and what had she seen from license holders in terms of you know what they really needed and what they were applying for and in general how could we make this a more efficient and, and understandable process. So from that work you received her memo which then further uh, recommended more specific uh, changes to our uh, license classifications, which we fully support um, as a basis of discussion and review with you, Council, to um, uh, get your recommendation and direction to bring back actual ordinance uh, revenue changes. So I, I welcome your uh, input here, Janine, as well. But <coughs> what, what we have looked at is uh, consolidating into Class A a number of licensed uh, classes that currently exist and to focus Class A on on-premises consumption. So make it a bigger uh, definition and <clears throat> issue of Class A license to a number of different establishments that currently might need a Class A and an option or um, any number of other variations, but I would defer to you, Janine, to talk further about this if you care to. Sure, thank you. So one of the things that, um, well, in putting this together, 
I had taken into account what I had heard from council members and then also the experiences that I had had with licensees, especially at renewal. They were very confused by the, the number of classifications and then specifically at the, um, the options where we were up to 10 different options. Some of those only applied to maybe one um, business. And so we really tried to look at um, more clearly defining the different classifications and then determining which options do we continue to need. Um, the biggest change and one of the things that I had heard from council um, in discussion was if this works for a municipality like Chicago, why can't it work for us? And so I looked at um, some of the different, there were 10 different um, municipalities that Ansel Glink had looked at. Then we also looked at Chicago to see what they were doing. And this very first classification, Class A, was taken from Chicago, and that is consumption on premises, incidental activity. <coughs> and so if you look at it, um, and if you were to look at um, and comparing to the classifications we currently have, many of those read exactly the same with the exception of the definition of the, t the type of business. So um, what you see happening at a restaurant um, may be pretty much the same as what you're seeing happen at a um, bowling alley. It's on-site consumption. They can both sell um, alcohol to be taken off premises. Um, and then, I hesitate to get into this, but Alderman Schmidt and I were talking about it beforehand. The biggest change with this would be looking at gaming because we would have to either say no gaming for restaurants anymore. I mean, that would still grandfather in the current ones. Um, and we already have a moratorium, so we're not issuing at this time, but that would mean moving forward. Um, even when there was a license or a license becomes available, we wouldn't issue to restaurants. Or we say anyone in this class would be eligible to apply. Now, one of the things we can always say is that it has to come before council for approval. So I would say that this classification is probably the one that where we let Class A absorb many of the others that were listed here. But um, in looking at that, I think that is much simpler for them. And then we look at some of the different options. Class B um, is the same, but we let Class B kind of absorb um, the fraternal and veteran organizations, and then we added um, liquor producer and reseller. This is something that, again, Chicago is doing. And what we were hoping to bring, and we've talked about bringing it to our downtown, but anywhere in the city, is to bring in a winery, maybe. So um, somebody who would have on-site um, consumption of wine, just like we do our brewers. So these are producers, and so they they are separated out a little bit. That's a little bit different, but they all have the same criteria, um, criteria, and um, the sub points underneath are identical. So it's easy to consolidate those. Um, they are all able to have gaming now, and they would continue to, um, and then. The one thing that is different in the case of these three, the class B, double B, and triple B, is um, like many of the other municipalities, including Chicago, it would allow um, anyone under 21 to enter if they're with not an adult, but a parent or guardian is what is stated. Um, and so they are never able to sit at the bar, just like they couldn't, they were able to go into a veterans organization prior they could never sit at a bar. Um, this would be true of taverns if they wanted to go into one um, that currently, let's say one like Hafner's. Currently they can't go in because they're class B. They would be able to as long as they don't sit at the bar, but they would have to be accompanied by a parent or guardian. So it's a little bit different, but I thought it really brought us a little closer to that discussion of incidental activity because we were saying, well, if we start to look at the 50%, which in our review of these other municipalities, when they talk about incidental activity, they're talking about 50% of revenue. So we were looking at maybe looking at some different factors, but at this point, even if we just look at that, um, 
it brings us a little bit closer to that because it doesn't mean that we have to actually reclassify them. They could still stay at that. Um, rather than read through all of this, maybe I would open it up and see if you all had any questions. Alderman Timian? Uh, we currently oh, have sorry. a, I'm, I'm sorry, Your Honor. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> we currently have a poor option for Class C, and I noticed that is not here. We moved that to a new classification, and I can tell you why we did that, and that, what we're proposing is a specialty classification. So that would be, and I kind of named those that are, you know, stationers or have, you know, make your own art or candles, things like that. <laughs> right now we have um, a pour your own candle that wanted to do BYOB, right. and that's allowable by class. But if they were to <laughs> want to sell, this would allow them to right. then get this license and they could actually sell if they wanted to. Um, what that allows us to do is, or what it, it steers us away from is at renewal, after this past renewal um, period, we had already added the class, or rather option eight, which we did for one particular retailer that had specialty items. Um, but then every class C, C was applying for option eight. They all wanted to pour on site. That's not always appropriate for a convenience store, and I don't think that was the intent of council. Correct. So in then shifting away from an option and actually making it a specific classification, I think then we don't have that issue. Mm -hmm. So that would be class F. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other questions, comments, Mr. Went? So I, I like this, and um, I think it does kind of get more to the point. Of, uh, my son, I was like, hey, let's go get a burger at Hafner. I was like, I can't take it at Hafner. I know. Um, but uh, the question becomes for the class A now, um, would all of our current class K's? We've always known that B. when class K sunsets that they can convert to an A or B because the code allows that, and we anticipate that probably will happen. But but as it stands here, there could be as many K, I mean, so any, any K could, could claim a class A, right? Mm -hmm. And so, our limitation of five or the sunset or whatever, all of a sudden this just opens it up. The, we could wind up with a proliferation of 10 of them in the city, all claiming class X, Let's right? Let's see what Ms. Gustafson well, says. Well, they would get to meet the requirements of class A. And, and we would, you know, I, And I, I think they do, don't they? Not the incidental activity. Right. So the incidental is close to a but I think in Class A, the alcohol is incidental to their gaming. The consumption of alcohol on premises is incidental to their gaming, their primary purpose. Oh, I see what you're saying. So, I mean, you could. But the code only allows them, and, and we're not proposing changing that the K would have to convert to an A or a B and they have to function, well, that was as a restaurant. Yeah. Or, because, but because they can't function as, I mean, it's not listed here that they can function as a video gaming establishment, but have to be one of those different types that yeah. are listed there. Uh, listed where? For in the in A section, is that what you're talking about? The yeah, with the hotel, a. banquet hall, theater, bowling alley. Right. Right. Yes, but I believe it's the chili bowl situation. Yes, yeah. that we're discussing. Yeah, or the mm -hmm. yeah, or what's a recreational facility? Or we got a gym that is you can come and do push-ups. I, yes, I, I, I just I, because people will play with it, and I just want to make sure that we're closed. Whatever. Yeah. Holds. I mean, one of the municipalities I looked at um, had listed laundromat. We don't have that issue right now. Let's not open it up to that. <laughs> so we didn't add it. Thank we you. only spoke to the ones spoke that we ones currently we want, have. as opposed to trying to capture <laughs> everything that could. Right. We just yeah. spoke to what we currently have to make sure that we were serving them well. Got it, Mr. Schmidt. Yeah, I. I think the direction this is going, simplifying things, makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I think that whatever the requirements are there will be people trying to take advantage or see how they can work their way around it. Um, 
and, and, and how we can think that through and try to avoid that makes sense. I don't think that looking at this, we can really totally separate this from the incidental or primary business because I think that this is built on that policy decision. Um, to even call something incidental activity when we have not yet decided what incidental activity is seems like a strange choice. Um, and, and I guess I would like to step forward and say, as I was reading through the definitions and the codes and looking through everything, I read through what our definition of the code of is as a restaurant. And it gives broad language uh, related to how, how that needs to present itself. As any public place kept, used, maintained, advertised, and held out to the public as a place where the sale of food is the principal business purpose, where meals are actually prepared and regularly served without sleeping accommodation. It goes on a little, but that hits the big points. Um, obviously, we couldn't use that exact definition here. I am in favor of stepping away from a revenue indicator of primary business in favor of a definition in that style. I think it allows for a business to put out there and to push and to try. And I think that different revenue sources have different levels of success. And, um, and it always will come back to the gaming piece where these, if a restaurant or bar has been allowed to have a gaming machine and it's been very successful, I don't think pulling that back makes sense as long as they are following that definition. And I think that definition for years has not been enforced well. And I think as we start to make those efforts to step up that enforcement, that will help to solve that problem. And, and that, that, to me, is the right way forward. So just so I understand how you're describing it, you're really <laughs> talking about a functional definition, right? How a place, an establishment functions as opposed to what it produces. <laughs> yes. And, and, and we'd have to obviously rework that language, and there could even be certain subsets. Like, to qualify as this, you have to have that. You know, we could include for a mm -hmm. restaurant must have these things. A bowling alley must have lanes, things of, <laughs> of a simple <laughs> nature. <laughs> right, right, right. But we've got the chili bowl that had a hood and met all the restaurant definitions. And it was just a I, but, it, but but and I think I would look at this and say it does not appear that it does meet the, the restaurant definition. No, no, they got the restaurant license originally because they met exactly the restaurant. I mean, our staff gave it so because they said. This feeds all of our requirements. They installed a hood. They didn't use it. But well, and it met our where meals are actually prepared and regularly served yeah, is the piece that should have been on the renewal be their problem. Yeah. Good so, I, I understand what you're saying. I'm just, I, I'm just saying that unless you are very specific about it. Your revenue, you can't hide because you got to pay taxes, you got to do those things. And so that is a definition that is clear. If this is your primary purpose or this is your incidental purpose, you know, we can change the percentages or whatever, but it is a known factor. The other things you get into and it. Can I ask a question yeah. of the clerk and uh, our legal counsel? When it comes to reporting their income, how easy is it for them to fudge those numbers when you're dealing with the kind of definition you're talking about? I'm just a question. Other than it's a felony? Well, in speaking to our finance manager, those are reported, but they're not audited statements that they're That's coming what from. I'm so it's just their submission of those. Um, with the exception of gaming, which goes to the state, and that's right. a little bit different. Okay. But if this is something that you all have an appetite for us to pursue, we can, I mean, I can talk to Chicago and see how, I mean, they're using 50%. I can ask, are they look, looking at other factors? How are they defining? Are they you, doing it in terms of function? We can look a little further. Ms. Christopoulos. So we have talked for quite a while about <clears throat> expanding the definition of primary business to include the and adding other factors, so a multi-factor uh, definition, which might be a better test for how they are truly operating. As we mm -hmm. experienced in hearings on this, uh, a no 
number of conditions can affect revenue. And that might not be a, a good test on its own. So we could bring back to you, which we had contemplated, um, a, a different definition which might help um, which might help better to define what class A is or class B or any of our um, licensed classes so that there are more factors to look at and maybe that would Make well, what you're saying, and I, I weigh in here only as the liquor commissioner and <laughs> having to enforce things and uh, review stuff. Uh, that's what I've preferred is to look for multi-factor some way. But I also think it is a it is a middle road if it is not unwieldy, where we get some kind of clear, very clear statements and clear expectations. <laughs> Right. If there's a way to combine this by getting it defined more appropriately, that then that's what I would like to look at. But but it's up to you all. I mean, they they need direction from you all. I would like to see multi-factor, just to see what the language, you know, the logic logic decision tree would look like. Uh, we can make it work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the, our head nods right and every place thumbs up. <laughs> okay. So this is still a work in progress. Yeah. So we're checking in with you tonight on this. We'll go back. We'll do more work. Um, there are pretty big changes here. So we certainly don't want to do it hastily. Mr. Wendt. Now, this isn't one of the suggested changes, but as every time you read it, something else pops out at you. Um, there's the provision, and it's in our current code, about if you want to shut down for a private event, that you have to write a note to the mayor and tell her, hey, uh, we're, we're having a Christmas party tonight, and you know, but I can only do three parties a year? Mm -hmm. What's the concept behind that? I think some of it might have been so they weren't so they were truly functioning as a restaurant or as a tavern mm -hmm. and not like a rental hall right. or something like that. So I don't know what came well. But what we're proposing here is special use permits. What used to be option six, which is offsite public property, or option seven onsite special use, we're proposing two special use permits that would come out of the mayor and clerk's office. And we would just pretty much give them a letter, like we do for option seven right now, and say, we acknowledge and approve you having this special event on site. Um, again, if we use the example of Hafner's, they I used to have an annual Hafner Fest. We'd always write them a letter every year saying we acknowledge and that's fine. And then let our um, first responders know that that's going on. I will say we have had a hearing. Um, Chief Galt can weigh in on this if he needs to, but there, there's... When, when places have private events and don't like follow those rules, right? And if they were doing that over and over again, it can lead to chaos in the streets. I mean, downtown, you know, there were, there was advertising, et cetera. We talked about that. So this is, this is, it, it sounds kind of trivial, well, but, I, but I, I, I hear I'm what you're saying. I, I totally hear what you're saying, but yeah. I think there is a need, especially with A and B, for the special use things to be pretty tight. I think so too. Uh, along that line, uh, you know, I'm thinking of uh, Class F mostly because uh, I'm friends with uh, the Trimbles from Watermark. Uh, they used to have, be able to have special use permits a couple times a year before they had, you know, uh, wine tasting or just like a free champagne flute on. Uh, retail week or you know whatever it is but since they got their liquor license their understanding is they can no longer do the free you know um tasting taste or i don't know if it's tasting or if it's just like uh like uh the lighting on the commons will hand out champagne 
as part of an event because they have the liquor license they can no longer do that is that still no they can they can with a liquor license they can definitely do that okay then you maybe some... then that's just a confusion well the the training was just on the 14th so hopefully yeah, they've <laughs> followed up if they had yeah. any questions. I'll, I'll, and that'll be something yeah. you'll get that <laughs> in the next <laughs> stats and information report about um, Ansel Glink and Mark Heimley put on a training that we had on the 14th, and it was very good, well received. But it was really a nice opportunity to meet with those owners and liquor managers and answer their questions. Um, you might be thinking of um, Trimble Point. I don't know that. I mean. Without a liquor license, they were never given a special use permit before, but Trimble Point was because they always had a special event for first responders. And so they did it on site and they received a letter for special use, option seven. So I was thinking of Watermark, but I can, I can follow yeah. up offline about that. Okay. Mr. Schmidt yeah. and then Mr. O'Brien. Um, I, I think Honorable Wentz's point about the events. Uh, it had caught my eye too, but we also have banquet halls now would have a class A license and only allowing a banquet hall to have an event three times a year seems counter to the business oh. model. So that's probably just something to take a closer look at. But my, um, I would be interested in changing our Sunday hours to match the Monday through Thursday hours on most classifications. Um, I, I'm just curious like if there is any legal consideration yeah. or law enforcement consideration that would say we should not allow that Sunday morning from 6 to 10 a.m. to be a time when those venues could serve alcohol. Chief Galt. <laughs> um, is there a law enforcement consideration of why we should not extend uh, alcohol sales on Sunday from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m.? And that's bringing it in line with what we have we do it for Saturday. Saturday. Well, so Monday through Thursday is 6 a.m. until 1. Friday and Saturday is 6 a.m. until 2. And my thought is that Sunday, I understand historically why that's in place, but many of us go to church before that, after that, other nights, or don't go to church. And I don't think it is. Um, if someone's got to have brunch. It's a pretty common ordinance amongst the cities. I mean, I remember East Moline at least had the same, uh, you know, closing prohibition on sales. I mean, I'd have to probably research it. I mean, I think it's kind of a concept to hit the reset button and, you know, let people uh, have a break from the weekend party. Um, I mean, I, don't, I guess I don't really have a, a position on it one way or the other. You know, I, I don't see a huge issue with it, but I think it's probably fairly consistent with the other cities. Yeah, I one time state law? Yeah, no problem. My, yeah. my guess my guess that's where this yeah. Is. yeah, I feel yeah, like it was state law. Now it's really just legal. It's, yeah, it's a whole over. I mean, at one time, many of you have been around a long time, and there was 4 a.m. liquor licenses for, for a long yeah. time. So I remember those days. <laughs> 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 I remember them. <laughs> I remember. Okay, I mean, thank you. you. Yes, happened. Mr. Timmy. I would second, you know, this is not a yeah. motion, I understand that, but I had <laughs> in favor of also bringing everything to 6 a.m. Yeah. for A and B. Sorry, Mr. O'Brien was next. Okay, I had a question. Uh, if I can get it in here, please. Uh, my question was about the just uh, on that previous question, extended hours to 3 a.m. Now, didn't we just have an incident at that was pretty late? Was it the 1848? Was that really late at night? 2 a.m. 2 a.m. And I'm questioning, I mean, what if we leave them open that late? I mean, obviously, nothing good happens after midnight if you're out and about. It's a popular but, song somewhere, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so I think it's a country western song yeah. somewhere. But um, are we driving that, that back into the neighborhoods? Are we? I mean, because we have 
I mean, in my well, below the hill, there was a wild party that it was as a kind of a residence. Well, you know what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. slash residence business that a guy has that uh, kind of drove that element into the neighborhood in the late night hours. Uh, so are we better off to maybe leave them open? I don't know. I mean, if we have an ordinance that's going to, we got 14 of these places that are going to be open until 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. So my that's a my personal opinion, although I'm, I'm aging uh, real quickly, <laughs> is I'm not a huge fan of 3 a.m., but I also lived through the 4 a.m.s, wasn't a huge fan of that, as we, you know, Rock Island eliminated their 3 a.m. licenses because of the problems that they're having in the district. Uh, we certainly see the longer places are open with more alcohol at a commercial establishment. There, I mean, it's just common sense, right? There's more problems there. Um, the incident you asked me originally about that actually happened a little bit before 2 a.m. So I mean, obviously, uh, um, uh, you know, it's late, but I mean, it wasn't in the in the 2 to 3 a.m. hour that you're speaking of. There, we have had issues uh, at 2:50 at some of the other 3 a.m. Areas at closing time at the 3 a.m. hour. I don't. I'd have to research. I guess other areas. Uh, I mean, I would be guessing on your question about does it drive it into the neighborhoods. My anecdotal thought would be no, because and people could do that anyway, right? That people could mm -hmm. could, and you know that was popular back in the day after the 3 a.m. license. They'd have the after hours <laughs> spots. Um, I think those are you know, a different consideration. Most of those, I mean, even though I know you're talking about a, a problem, those are few and far between and they're smaller groups. There may be, you know, 10, 12 people there or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, bars can hold 7,500, 250, you know, so. I, and just so you are aware, I haven't had a lot of, we haven't had a lot of those requests for 3 a.m. options, but there was one and I turned it down because as in cons consultation, there's no need for us to increase that yeah, when our neighboring agree. cities are are reducing it, mm -hmm. you know we don't need to be the place they all come. Mm -hmm. So, all right, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Any further discussion today? Yes, Mr. Wen. So one of the the discussions we had at one point was a one location or one address having multiple um, licenses, mm -hmm. different classes. How is that addressed in in this? We really haven't. It's been addressed through enforcement. I'm sorry, Your Honor. I did it no, again. it's oh. fine. I'm sorry, okay, you're the clerk you, you, you and the assistant. Okay. Like you're <laughs> well, and actually, the mayor did it this time. So she actually asked both of them. And and for those of you that maybe don't know that, so we had two um, two properties that had convenient that convenience store licenses, like Class CC licenses, and then they were issued a second license an A and a B yeah, a when they added gaming, so a restaurant and a tavern mm -hmm. license. So th they're the only two locations in the city we have these dual licenses. But um, they did come in and we for hearings. hearings and talked through the fact that they needed, if they were going to continue to hold that restaurant or tavern license, they had to operate as such per the definition in the code. So they they developed a plan. They had 14 days to submit that, and they did. And then they had another period of time where they have to start making the changes. Um, when we had the training on the 14th, I did have one of those um, owners come up and were very excited about all the things that they've been doing and adding. So um, we'll be asking our inspections department to go out and take a look at that and was see. Was that the restaurant one or the bar? That was the restaurant one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So case by case, <laughs> case by case dealing with that, you know, but. If there are other issues surrounding that that you want to, no, uh, it was just a weird quirk in our yeah, it was. ordinance. But this, I guess, that quirk could pop up again because that, there's not a prohibition from it. Or well, um, it wouldn't with Class B because that is case by case <coughs> whether we give up Class B licenses now. Mm -hmm. So I guess we could look a little more closely at how we can. Because the class A becomes a much broader. Yeah, it, it really mm -hmm. boils down to what is that definition that is the source of the enforcement yeah. or that which all enforcement is based upon, right? That's what it sounds well, like to me. That becomes yeah. my concern is then, I know. okay. Then, yeah. I agree with you. We have to take a look at that. Uh, the other is it looks like for the, the class H is really the old class K. Yeah. 
Okay. And it says non-renewable in 2026. So that's the, mm -hmm. the, the, the sunset. sunset. But, um, it's not a big deal, but I, I think like in one of the points, it still talks about K licenses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, in K. Okay. Oh, in K, it talks about K license. It should say H license. But I just want to make oh, sure sorry. that that's. Because it may be something where okay. then we use that definition as a prohibited one for class A or something. And then that, then that way you say, oh, no, you're acting as, as that thing that is prohibited from now on. And now it's just mm -hmm. Since it will be in the. Sorry, notes. <laughs> Mr. Schmidt. Um, one item related to the items in uh, in the, the class B, all, all three, B, 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 M, B, 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 is we, we, in identifying the principal purpose, we identify it as sale of alcoholic liquor in, I guess that's on, on the class B, to a point, and, and I know we, we talked, we're going to keep looking at that principal incidental definition, but I, I think... A, for the primary business of a tavern, I don't know why we would include food as well in that definition. Or I understand we don't want restaurants to be operating as taverns and kind of going down. But if if a tavern decides to put up on a great menu and they should cheap be. beer, they yeah. should be allowed to do that. Yeah. In my opinion, I, I agree with you, a hundred percent. I think we should throw food in there as. And I think actually under BBB, it, food is included um, as their revenues, and so that made sense. No, no BBB, it says the revenue derived from food and or video games, oh, yeah. if applicable, shall be incidental. But yeah, so, you're right. I, I guess I'd like to see food should, moved into their primary business, even for It should count food. towards it. I, I, I'm 100% It creates the most flexibility for business evolution, but yes. Yeah, because mm -hmm. if, if you're yeah, a bar and, and all of a sudden you got the best burgers in town. Yeah. And, yeah. Right. and in a way, we don't want to stop, I think. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, the state. And their and grandfather, yeah. yeah. They We're, didn't have any of these who? laws. Yeah. Who? Yeah. White horse. Oh. White horse. Yeah. Yeah. We're out <laughs> to control the liquor. We're not out to control the food. Food, yeah. yeah. In the same way. Yeah, can I comment on yes. that? And, and actually, I'm really glad that came up because yesterday I received notice that Rock Island Elks are moving to Moline and they're planning to have alcohol as part of the meal. Oh. So that will become an issue for them as a members only club. And they're, most of their sales, they think, will be from food. So I'm glad you made that yeah, point. I, I think that's a great idea. That's fine. Yeah. Thank you. No, Thank perfect. you, Mr. Timmy. I have a slew of three questions and you just gave me one. So with the, uh, <laughs> the fraternal, uh, uh, cl the clubs, Oftentimes, uh, I'm thinking of the uh, the East End Club. They have the bar on one side and the, the conference room on the other. Does that not qualify as a special use because they're physically separated by a wall? Because they, they oftentimes rent out that space yeah, to host and event, the, yeah. and you go back and forth between the bar. So that's just a rhetorical question. Question is that a, is that does that require a special use permit, or because it's a separate? I guess it's not rhetorical. Because uh, it feels very separate. It is very separate. Yeah. Uh, so well, that's fair. I don't. In that case, they would not be. You would. You would buy your stuff. It, like. Yep. You don't go back and forth when there's an event because the event is the fair, event. Fair. Right. And the bar is the bar. Um. I guess. Uh, but people from the event go in and get, grab yeah, that drinks. Yeah. That's yeah. true. Yeah. yeah we've yeah, never so. really regulated that differently mm -hmm. than. <clears throat> they're just a, a club, and that's the way they're set up. Yep. I know that. Um, East End um, owners or liquor manager at the training came up and said, we're looking to put our gaming in a separate room so that when you come in, you can just go directly to the left and then kind of keep kids who are coming in for special parties mm -hmm. away from seeing that. I think that's something the council so probably would like. Are you saying, like, does class triple B allow them enough flexibility for that situation I, I just, or you're just wondering I, i'm kind of wondering if there's enough flexibility because they do rent out that hall often and i'm sure they're not alone and so do they require special use permits or because of the physical separation are they okay i would suggest that with um 
an organization like that where they kind of thrive on these special parties all the time, then maybe we write that into the definition of I that. I would agree. Yeah. That way it's, it's outside of the three yeah. Right. times. Yeah. Uh, and, and then I guess uh, my next question of three, uh, the last one's really easy. Uh, with these class H's, it does say uh, the non-renewal in 2026. Are ordinance header, headers binding or does that need to be in the body it needs to be in the body because okay. we specifically says that our headers aren't binding okay but. so then that was just a call out yes. lastly are these just going to be instantly transitioned once this is enacted the existing licenses there's I like a one that renewal okay so they'll be they'll last until renewal time yeah sure. was administrative night thank you <laughs> any further questions or commentary on this Okay. Thank you so much. We will continue you, with our work on that. Is there any public comment? <coughs> Nobody's here. All right. So I call the council to order for a regular meeting. Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Um, is there an invo uh, invocation while we're nope. no. Roll call, please. Alderman Williams? Present. Macias? Present. Went? Present. Timian? Present. Moyer? Present. O'Brien? Present. Waldron? Present. Schmidt? Present. Your Honor, request approval of Committee of the Whole and Council Meeting Minutes of April 5th, 2022, Council Meeting Minutes of April 12th, 2022, and appointments made during Committee of the Whole on April 26th, 2022. Second reading ordinances. Council Bill 3006-2022, an ordinance amending Chapter 24, Personnel of the Mulling Code of Ordinances, Section 24-3207, Appendix 1, by adding a job description for Land Bank Program Manager. Resolutions. Council Bill 1080-2022, resolution authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute and attest to a contract with Walter D. Lott Incorporated for motor fuel tax section 22-00000-00GM 2022 asphalt program for the amount of $994,675.80. Council Bill 1081-2022, a resolution approving a supplemental resolution for maintenance under the Illinois Highway Code for motor fuel tax Section number 22-00000-00GM, 2022 Asphalt Program, for the amount of $195,200.80. Council Bill 1082-2022, a resolution authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute and attest to a contract with Langman Construction Incorporated for motor fuel tax section 22-00000-01GM. 2022 Asphalt Maintenance Program for the amount of $153,420. Council Bill 1083-2022, a resolution approving a supplemental resolution for maintenance under the Illinois Highway Code for Motor Fuel Tax, Section Number 22000001 gm 2022 Asphalt Maintenance Program for the amount of $3,420. Council Bill 1084-2022, a resolution approving a supplemental resolution for improvement under the Illinois Highway Code for Section 21-002790RP, 26th Avenue, 3800 Block of 41st Street, in the amount of $240,683.69. Council Bill 1085-2022, a resolution authorizing the seating of home rule volume cap. Council Bill 1086-2022, a resolution approving a final change order with Emory Construction Incorporated for project number 1347, 2021 alley reconstruction for the amount of $22,486.95. Council Bill 1086, I'm sorry, I skipped one. Council Bill 1087 is next. A resolution authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute and attest to a contract with Davenport Electric Contract Company, project number 1373 I'm sorry, 2022 annual traffic signal replacement for an amount of $386,218.13. Council Bill 
Council Bill 1088-2022, resolution authorizing the interim city engineer to accept a proposal for professional engineering services with Jawal Hamilton Associates Incorporated for engineering corridor traffic study regarding project number 1390, Avenue of the City's traffic study for a time and material not to exceed amount of $96,950. Council Bill 1089-2022, a resolution authorizing the approval of supplement number one regarding the preliminary engineering service agreement for motor fuel tax with Hutchison Engineering Incorporated for the amount not to exceed $25,000. Council Bill 1090-2022, resolution authorizing the approval of a supplemental resolution for maintenance under Illinois Highway Code for Motor Fuel Tax, section number 21-0000000GM 2021 asphalt program for the amount of $200,000. Council Bill 1091-2022, a resolution authorizing the Municipal Services General Manager to submit a commitment for bidding road salt with the Illinois Department of Central Management Services for 4,000 tons that would commit the city to purchase a minimum of 3,200 tons and the ability to purchase up to 4,800 tons for the 2022-23 winter season. Motion. Motion. I move for approval, consent agenda. Second. Thank you, Mr. O'Brien, and seconded by Mr. Wendt. Uh, roll call, please. Alderman Schmidt. Aye. Williams. Aye. Macias. Aye. Went. Aye. Timian. Aye. Moyer. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Waldron. Aye. Eight ayes, no nays. And that motion passes. Non consent agenda, second reading ordinances. Council Bill 3005-2022, an ordinance amending Chapter 4, Alcoholic Liquor of the Mulling Code of Ordinances, increasing the number of Class CC licenses in the city at the request of Innovative Landscaping and Maintenance, LLC, doing business as QC Quick Stop. Motion to approve. Motion by Alderman Schmidt, seconded by Alderman Wendt. Discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Alderman Schmidt? Aye. Williams? Aye. Macias? Aye. Wendt? Aye. Timian? Aye. Moyer? Aye. O'Brien? Nay. Waldron? Nay. Six ayes, two nays. And that motion passes. Resolutions. Council Bill 1079-2022, a resolution authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute and attest to a second amendment to the Heritage Place Parking Structure Lease Agreement between the City of Moline and Heritage Place Associates, LLC, extending the agreement through the 31st day of December 2037. And I think, Your Honor, you're looking for two motions. One to approve the um, <coughs> updated second amendment to the lease agreement we, we need if council so desires to update what came through cal last time so yeah we need that move to approve second all right so you want to approve the one that goes to 2037 i'm sorry That's, who's the second uh mr timian the discussion mr went uh well actually i'd like to hear from the staff i know that some additional information is going to come yep. to light through this this process mm -hmm. I'd like to hear that. Yes, the overview. Yes, yeah. please, Mr. Vitas. Sure, I'd be happy to. And with us this evening, of course, uh, Mr. Strandland is here representing the uh, the uh, property owner, Samco Properties, I guess, Samco LLC, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we've had an opportunity to meet with Mr. Strandland and review the, uh, the original submittal, uh, which would have taken the lease out to 2051. Uh, in further discussions with Mr. Strandland, it came to the conclusion that the lease itself needed to go an additional, as it's laid out in the Second Amendment, uh, an additional six years beyond what remains on the original lease, which was 39 years. So the original lease was 39 years, and this lease would this would extend that lease for an additional six years uh, to the benefit of Samco Properties, so that they could go forward with the leasing of the sixth floor of the building to the U.S. government. And they have that lease in hand, and that's where that sits at this point. Um, beyond that, uh, there's the issue of the maintenance of the facility itself. And I think there's been, there was some confusion. Historically, there's been some confusion as to how that maintenance was supposed to work, specifically sections 8.1 and 8.2. So as we reviewed that as well, that is included in there and it is understood whose responsibility it is going forward uh, for uh, not only the capital investment, capital investments being the city's obligations, which we have done once in, in order to maintain that garage, 
I believe somewhere to the tune of almost eight hundred thousand um, dollars. And I think we replaced all of the lighting as well as some of the decking inside and some of the spalling, uh, which is basically capital investment in the garage that's required. Uh, but then the issue of routine maintenance, you know, painting or cleaning or minor repairs. Um, I think there was some confusion. I think that's pretty much been cleared up. I think going forward, uh, Mr. Stranlin, representing his client, understands and has agreed in principle that we would uh, move forward without the city incurring <coughs> some of the expenses it has historically incurred. Uh, up until now, we've probably incurred from since inception of the uh, construction and through the first lease and through to date. Uh, close to $800,000 in, in, in maintenance. Um, routine maintenance based upon extrapolating information uh, in terms of what is in Section 8.1 versus Section 8.2. Uh, we know that it's about $2,500 a month uh, going forward in terms of just simply maintaining it in accordance with the lease. So that's the number that was calculated based upon removing uh, utility costs, removing snow removal costs, those things which are the, you know, the landlord's responsibility, in this case the, 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 uh, the lessor, who is the city. Um, and I think that's where we're at. I think going beyond this particular lease uh, as it exists, um, there's nine years remaining very specifically um, on the leases that, you know, that are available to uh, SAMCO. Um, there are tenants, of course, occupying the spaces now, I don't know uh, what those leases are or what the length of time is for those leases, if they coincide with the uh, the 39-year provision or not. We don't know that answer. Maybe Mr. Stralin can speak to that tonight. But it's our recommendation that we do approve the agreement going forward this evening. Uh, the U.S. government is anxious to get started on uh, renovations to the space. Uh, Samco Properties has been in contact with, obviously, with uh, with the government, uh, and they're looking to make those leasehold improvements to uh, uh, the Heritage Place property, and uh, we don't want to delay that. But I think um, going forward, if there's leases that go beyond the 39th year that have not been negotiated at, 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 the, at the present time, I think it behooves the city then to at least uh, have the opportunity to meet with Samco, Mr. Strandland, or whoever represents Samco at that time. We don't know who that will be, um, or when that will even happen, because there are empty floors in the building, and our goal is to fill space. Uh, that we would bring those back, and we would deal with those on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think that's, I think it's fair to Samco. I think it's fair to the city and the taxpayers. Um, it was a, a great investment, and, and it has paid debit, dividends through time. But like all commercial office retail spaces, uh, filling those spaces is a difficult task now. Uh, not just in Moline, but in cities like Chicago and all across the United States, it is a major topic of discussion that goes on uh, in, the, in the real estate world as to how to fill commercial office space since people are working remotely. Um, as you know, we have two major corporations headquartered here, um, and, uh, and their spaces are not occupied full time. And in some cases, I'm understanding that they will not be occupied full time in the future. So, you know, those are things that we have to have on the radar screen down the road and thinking about adaptive reuses possibly. But, but for tonight's purposes, we're recommending approval going forward based upon uh, that which I have entered into the record this evening. Thank you. Um, here for any questions? Questions, Mr. Yeah. Macias. Um, yeah, I had the opportunity to tour the place and um i had never been in there and it's obvious that this whole structure the the parking was made for this building and if we can get um spur more people to work downtown that's just going to be a plus for everybody um so yeah i'm i'm in support of um calling an amendment to um adopt a language that, that's proposed with the um with the extension to december 31st, 2037. I'll second that. Well, what do you mean? Should I, um, um, I, I make because a that, motion? That, that amendment is on the floor now. That was Mr. Oh, O'Brien and, and Mr. Tibbs. 
that second. was the original. The original. That, I think we that was not, the original. This, the amended is with the mm -hmm. section 3.3. Three. Three. Well, he, he, he moved to, 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 to the oh. amendment oh, once, to the and amendment. I checked oh. on it. He was. He said he was talking yes. about the yeah. one. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, same, I thought it was the original that you amended. Yeah. You, okay. Okay. I'll retract that mm -hmm. from the floor. <laughs> Mr. Wine. Um, thank you, Your Honor. Um, so I, too, no. could not agree more that that uh, that we want this this tenant to move in. We want to, um, uh, to encourage development downtown and, and those sorts of things. But as a council, we have to think strategically on, on how to do how to do this. And with my conversation I had with uh, um, uh, legal counsel and and uh, the uh, city administrator earlier, um, a couple of things had been brought forth that is information that we don't know. Um, like for instance, we still don't know how many parking spots that government entity actually needs. We do know now that they don't need 30 years but they only need 15, nine under the current agreement, and then they're asking for an additional six. Um, we, as the stewards of the taxpayers of Moline and the um, assets of the city of Moline, this parking ramp is one of the most expensive assets that, that, that the city has. And, and to Alderman Macias points, I completely agree. We want to leverage this to encourage as much development as we can downtown. And in our comprehensive plan right now, we have an infill site just to the east of this, that, that uh, empty parking lot. Our comp plan calls for a multi-use, multi-story development right there. Right now, my concern is that this parking ramp is underutilized. It may have been built for this building, it may be overparked for how it, it currently is. But in our conversations, and this is why I'm a little surprised with, with the recommendation, I, I thought the recommendation for, was going to be, do you have those four points? I, so I, <clears throat> I believe that Mr. Vitas was making a recommendation to limit the extension or the Second Amendment to the lease to just the number of spaces needed for the six floor tenants. I, I will make that motion to make that, that is, amendment. That is correct. Right, okay. and then to confirm that the lessee would, um, is responsible fully for maintenance pursuant to 8.2. That's also correct. So I, I believe that that <coughs> is the way that we satisfy council concerns about are we, you know, is this too much for what is actually needed and does that save the, uh, the opportunity for other parking uh, as downtown further develops while in, encouraging and supporting existing tenants and, and um, the lessee's opportunities. So, 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 wait a second, please. So, could you please read out what the recommendation is on that portion that would be an amendment to an amendment? Right. So yep. it would be a motion to agree to a second amend, amended lease with the following additions that uh, let's see confirms that it is and will be responsible for maintenance as described in 8.2 of the lease and to limit the extension of the second amended lease to the number of spaces associated with the sixth 
four tenths of the heritage sites. So that's that's the recommended amendment to an amendment. And is there a motion for and that? And I'll, I'll make that motion that motion we Motion by Alderman Went. Is there a second? Alderman Moyer. Discussion. Mr. Went. Yeah, in, in through this conversation, I think that this is meets all the objectives. We make sure that this this tenant moves in, uh, that they are um, uh, they're they're taken care of, um, that we don't miss out on them. Uh, that two, that the eighty thousand dollars that the taxpayers have paid in maintenance over the last three years, that per the lease is clearly the. Uh, 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 the tenant's uh, responsibility that they confirm that they're going to be able to do that. But it also then protects us with flexibility moving forward. We want to work with them. They, we want them to, to fill this building up and, and, and do all of those things. But we also want the flexibility if we have a new development next door that's residential and we need a couple of those parking spots that we can uh, utilize this. So I, I think what the uh, uh, the city staff, the, the city administrator and, and the attorney had come up with is, I think, the best of both worlds that uh, that meets all of our objectives. Sir Timmy. Uh, I, has this uh, been run by the lessee at all? Or is this, okay. Uh, only, only this few minutes. Is it uh, out of order to ask uh, their opinion during this while you're here? That's what it's, yeah. <laughs> That's, I'm, I'm fine with that if you'd like to weigh in on that. Mr. Sure. Mm -hmm. They're the yeah. petitioner, so absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I came, uh, I thought, to answer questions about an amendment mm -hmm. that was negotiated and I was told to be recommended tonight on Friday. Uh, so I just heard about this amendment. Uh, I, I stepped out just a minute to see if I could contact the landlord, uh, not able to do that. So uh, if you're asking me to accept it, uh, you know, the council's free to do what they think is in the city's best interest. I've much appreciated the time staff has provided to me during the month of April. Uh, my alderman, uh, Macias, uh, uh, Alderman Macias came and and I, I heard him speak a minute ago. Uh, the, uh, the change is designed apparently for one lease. And uh, that wasn't the, the, the original request. The original request was more expansive than that. And it, as the letter I wrote in response to questions, I said uh, that the thrust behind the request was that lease, that was the thrust. It wasn't the only thrust. Uh, so, uh, you know, th th this council can uh, act on uh, a proposed amendment or ma make a recommendation and then we could come back, uh, and, you know, to see where it leads. Uh, that's the best I can do uh, with the short notice. So uh, the, uh, the original, uh, well, the, the, the agreement that I uh, conveyed to the client or the recommendation that I, con I conveyed to the client, correct me if I'm wrong, Margaret, <clears throat> was an extension to 2037 uh, mm -hmm. without getting into the details of a tenant lease. That was what uh, I conveyed on Friday, am I correct? That is what was brought before tonight. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so earlier tonight, you know, I'm hearing that it's measured by spaces. As to the underutilization, uh, I, I sense that the council says, or some of the council says, there's a problem. You know, having, having been experienced with the city, uh, and having a lot of respect for the staff, where there's a problem, there should be a study, basic. Uh, and so, as I understand it, presently, there is no parking study. I've made inquiry that goes to this point. 
they're, they're parking studies, but as to this point, the computation is a design computation made for the construction of the building. That computation, and, and we can bring the architect who did the most recent remodeling, and that would be Jeff Dismer. I, I think most of you are familiar with Jeff Dismer. I checked with him today, and he validated the fact that the computation gets to close to three uh, spaces per hundred, no, per thousand square feet, which is on a low range of offices. So the, the ramp is designed for the building. That uh, has proven true uh, with regard to the occupancy when it's full. I think many people remember when Deere and Company filled the building, it was fully consumed, the ramp was fully consumed uh, during the business hours. Another uh, perception that was uh, attended to and agreed to on uh, Friday related to uh, the perception that the city hasn't had uh, public benefit, or at least sufficient public benefit for the money that it, it has spent. Um, it might be appropriate for me to do this at a later time, but um, there's information on that point that is, uh, consists of observations in the month of April. And, and that was since the time I first appeared. Uh, and if I may distribute a handout, Your sure. Honor? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll ask you to pass these down. I'll explain Thank you. what it relates to. Do you have enough? What the, what the handout is, is uh, four pages. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's for sure. Thanks. Let me know if anybody is sure. You have one. Clark has one for sure. Okay. You might check. No, you do You look. Thank you. This is an extra. Oh, sorry. Here. This is very good. So the observation that has been made that re relates to the public use is uh, from the city website uh, entitled, uh, first page is uh, the event parking designated by the city. Uh, I'll think, give you a moment to digest it. What you'll see is the uh, the middle red block is the site we're talking about. It, it has a band on it that says Heritage Place, and it's, it's labeled Tax Slayer uh, Center Overflow Parking. Uh, that uh, connotes uh, the fact that it's regularly used for the public. Uh, what you uh, see next is signage that has been in place for a good long time, probably five years or more, because it says I Wireless Center. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. And it is wrong. Yes, you're right, Mr. Yeah. Uh, Alderman Wendt. It is, it is wrong. wrong, because he has read the lease, which I appreciate. <laughs> uh, he, has, he has read the lease that was made long ago, and, and the relationship of the parties, in my view, and I think in the city attorney's view and the city ministry's view, is basically a relationship that has been working. It's a public-private partnership that has been working. And you'll see from the signage, uh, as Mr. Uh, as Alderman Wendt points out, it's wrong, but the, the lease says uh, for the tenants, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. But as I explained at, when I was here last, the tenants are told, at least the tenants that occupy by the space that I occupy, uh, to, is it's five o'clock, and, and I'm sure law enforcement knows that it's five o'clock because uh, people start assembling downtown. This is a good thing. 
they started using the restaurants and the bars, and and the uh, the migration uh, is then to the event of the arena. Um, but the, the point is, it's a wonderful asset, not just for a tenant, not just for uh, a building owner. It's for the public, and it's recognized as for the public. And uh, what you'll next see, I think, on page three is, is more signage. Why is that signage there? Good question. <laughs> uh, uh, I think, I'm speculating, uh, I haven't investigated, but I'm thinking that the Tax Slayer Center wants people to come to the Tax Slayer Center and not look for the iWireless Center. And so uh, they, some, someone puts a sign there with each event and uh, for certain events that are deemed to be sold out events, those events, um, they also staff uh, with someone who charges for parking. Those charges are divided uh, between the city and the uh, tax layer center. Uh, finally, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to move this along. Finally, uh, what you'll see is the, uh, a photograph from the seventh floor. It's not a great photograph because it's taken through glass. Nobody climbed up on the roof and, and took it uh, in, a, in a better uh, way. But um, that uh, depicts uh, Snoop Dogg's uh, performance <laughs> night. And uh, I, have, I have a collection of other photographs, but uh, I, I'm representing to you, if, and if, especially if anyone was there, they would know, that um, the city served the public well and this building served the public well because that is the upper deck. The entire ramp was full, $15 a car, divided between the Tax Layer Center and uh, uh, the city. Uh, it, you know, it, it, I could go on about the contributions the landlord makes, but the, the, the simple request is that the city adhere to a recommendation that was prepared to be made on Friday that the uh, extension go to 2037. That was the request. That's what I forwarded to, that was the recommendation. That's what I forwarded to uh, the landowner. That's what I had the authority to say could be executed. You know, with, with regard to measuring it by the lease, it puts, uh, it, it, it's a different, it's a different proposal. Uh, and I think everyone would appreciate that it's quite, it's different. And uh, it, it requires that every tenant justify parking, not based on an architect design, but based upon, I don't know, it's, it's a really, it's a, it's a moving target. Uh, uh, but, you know, we, we appreciate the relationship that the city has with this property. It's been a good relationship. It's been honored to the point that we didn't propose altering any of the other provisions. I, I, I would say that if, if when you read the lease, and I know I know some of you have, uh, it's very, I, I didn't draft it. It was five, six attorneys ago, six mayors ago, uh, uh, it, it, but there's a it's, a, it's very basic in this way. If there is dissatisfaction, rising to the level of default. If any maintenance is not adhered to, that's the obligation of one party or the other, there's a very specific provision, and this isn't gonna surprise you, especially if you're a landlord uh, or a tenant for that matter, uh, you have a duty to give notice and there's a right to cure within 30 days. To my understanding, again, I'm, I'm fairly recent to this, there has never been any such notice, not once. Uh, that's a good thing. Uh, but it, it's not necessarily a good thing if you're measuring what you are looking toward in the future in a good relationship and saying there's been a violation, there's been unfairness. Uh, that's unfortunate because the lease would require that kind of notice. So with that said, I, I, I apologize for not having the authority to say Thank you very much. This is a great proposal, but it isn't what we asked for. Uh, maybe we'll have the opportunity 
I mean, you can tell me if we have the opportunity to come back or or uh, hear, try to answer more questions that would support the original, not even the original, the, the, the request of last Friday. Thank you. Mr. Schmidt, and then I saw you. Um, and this is not a direct question for you. It's it's to counsel in that. So I understand wanting to look and say, hey, maybe we, if we've not been following through and looking at that in, uh, maintenance in the correct way and that we want to ensure that there's an understanding we will be doing that going forward, I have no problem with that. I'm glad we've sought out the proper timelines um, on the extension. But I think separating based on one tenant and then requiring, because that it gets in the way of operating their business and in, in a way that says every time you want to renew, you want to extend, you want to bring back a lease, you're going to, as was said, and you're going to have to be back at council saying, <laughs> can we please have those spots and not giving them the opportunity to fill those spots and not having to be able to do it without us getting involved. And if we need to have a conversation about utilization and about whether there's a handful of spots or a group of spots that are not being used that could come back to the city, that's a different conversation, but I am not interested in anything that's going to draw us away from one tenant over the other tenants. That is us meddling too much into a business rather than letting that business do them and us just deciding to go forward with an agreement or not. I have one quick question, if I could. Uh, 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 is it fair to understand a utilization question as um, there are still other floors empty, correct? Correct. So, that's, that, that's, so that's why the original. That's why. Go ahead, sorry. Go ahead. So underutilization could possibly be caused by under occupancy of this building. A absolutely. And I want to thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, for I think you attended an open house. Maybe yeah. uh, other staff did. Maybe other mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. council did. You'll you'll know from that. Uh, and those of you who haven't been there, I will say, second floor. Mm -hmm vacant fifth uh fifth floor vacant mm -hmm. sixth floor vacant and uh, that has not stopped the landlord from remodeling investing and not coming to the city for for relief uh but just gutting it out and and uh i'll note going all the way back to the beginning i know I know who has the, has had the listings for that, and I looked back, uh, and I, I can tell you it it's always advertised with ramp parking. Not a surprise. You go to the other vacant office properties downtown; they will advertise parking along with the building. And you know, it's not a secret. You must know they don't own that parking, uh, and, and you know, and every deal is different. This one, yes, it, it was what we talked about when I was here before in terms of the economic terms. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I have a diagram outside this room that dates back to the original lease. What was it called? Super block. Why was it called super? I'd say because it was first. Uh, it was the incentive. Uh, and, and so uh, w with regard to the vacancy, you're absolutely right. Yeah, okay. you know, it, Thank you. It, it, that that goes to. I just wanted to understand are, that yeah. piece a little more, Mr. Warren. Well, th thank you, Your Honor, um, and and I couldn't agree with you more. I, I I I think that we need to understand this utilization and uh, and to Alderman Schmidt's uh, point about you know if we need to come back and try to figure that out, I think we should have that flexibility. If we pass the underlining where. The lease goes for another nine years, and then we give another six-year extension on it. We're now 15 years out in the future before we can have that conversation because, or we have any leverage for that conversation because it, you're giving it all away right now. And so to that point regarding parking utilization, part of the reason why we, we don't know this is, quite honestly, I had sent... I think the day after the last presentation, questions regarding what the current utilization is. How many parking spots we have? How many parking spots are they using? You know, all of those sorts of things and have received no answers on. Uh, I asked, and understandably so, how many spots we're talking about for this particular lease 
and was told, well, we could provide that, but only in closed session. And, and I understand all of those things. And so I, I think what we're being asked to, much like the last time when we were asked to, to extend it to 2051, and then all of a sudden we started asking some questions and it was like, oh, we don't need 2051, we can go back to 2037, which is much better for us flexibility-wise and, and those sorts of things. I think what we should probably do is table this until we can get that some of those information because I think we're making a decision here based on not full information. And, 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 and I understand where, where Roger is coming from. It, it is working. It, it, this location, for $1, they get to use a parking ramp, which is amazing for a building. I, I, I know that in, a, in a, 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 a place right across the street, um, that if a law firm was uh, renting in there, they then had to pay uh, to, to park many other people in our rent. And so the landlord gets additional rent because it's just built into, into that. And so I think understanding what is going on here is, is key to this. Um, and so actually I will make a uh, motion to a table and, until our next meeting, hoping that we'll get the additional information to make a, uh, a proper decision. There a second. Well, again, motion fails for lack of a second. So we're still talking about the amendment to the amendment. You a new comment? Yeah. Roger, are you guys still of the position where you can't divulge to us how many parking spots that the new tenant needs? Well, I'm not, I haven't negotiated that lease. I thought you guys had a lease in hand. I have a lease in hand. I didn't negotiate it. I, I, so. There's a, there's a formula that must exist with the GSA as to how many they're ultimately going to need. Today, they met with the contractor. Um, actually, I should take that back. The architect met with a contractor, not the contractor, because I understand that as a uh, GSA lease, uh, this contractor they had in mind was going to uh, self-perform quite a bit of the work and uh, I'm not sure that the GSA wants it to be structured that way. I um, will go back to the lease which is in my briefcase and I'll look for that. It was the landlord's preference that there be some degree of proprietary information that the landlord was entitled to given the prospective tenant. It was my understanding that uh, if you wanted to see the lease, which I provided, uh, I think Mr. Vitas will say he, he looked through the lease. I saw the front cover. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll give I have to be specific. All right. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable giving you and leave with counsel the lease tonight and we can go into it and, and find the number of spaces in that lease. We can do that. Uh, if that's an important question, my contention is that the building is designed for the ramp and the ramp is designed for the building. You can do the math. And, and so if we're measuring tenant by tenant, then you know the landlord right now has nine years left and can make a better case for that after there's another lease and another lease. The, the way this was provided through 2037 is it, there was a provision that says the parties contemplate the uh, possible future need to negotiate in good faith from time to time. That doesn't mean 2037. That means any time. On the subject of further extension of the lease, upon the expiration of the term, da 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 da, then there's another desire to, to uh, enter into good faith negotiations. If the city is insecure with this relationship, I don't know if it's lack of trust or if it's driven by economics, uh, but if the city's insecure, I, I would modify those provisions to invite the city to come back and, and, and say, hey, wait a minute, you, we extended to 2037. We thought that you would fill up a larger portion of that ramp than you have. Let's, let's cut it back. Uh, you know, so in any event, I think the parties 
uh, through legal counsel, through uh, city attorney, through uh, city administrator, worked pretty hard to get to the point we were at Friday with the 2037. Uh, as to the unanswered questions, I have a letter that was sent within days of my last appearance that went to the city administrator, went to legal counsel. Ultimately, I understood Mr. Went, Alderman Went did not get it, and I sent it to him. I have a red line that, to the best of my ability, addressed the conversations we had. Mm -hmm. And so the pattern of practice that, that I've uh, followed is that the channel of communication needs to go to the mayor, city administrator, and legal counsel, and from that point is dispersed to the extent that it's appropriate to all counsel, well, not, to, not to just your point, To your point, the, the, really to get it back on track here, you're saying that there's an opportunity to talk more about these specifics, or we move forward as was intended, and so that's where things are at, correct? Pardon me? That's where things are at. We either move forward as is intended, or we move forward with a little more information from you. However, what I've heard and read previously is that, you, as you mentioned here, the landlord didn't want to have to divulge everything about the lease because of who it's with. Because it's a GSA lease. Right, exactly. Because there's so many contingencies, because it has not been publicly identified Correct. at this point. Okay, I you. have the lease with me. I'll be happy to share it with legal counsel, with city administrator, with you, Mayor, and then you can make the determination. And I pointed out, you have the authority to go into closed session, I believe, if mm -hmm. it relates to pricing for uh, uh, for this. I'm not sure that it can stay within the bounds of pricing because the discussion seems to, mm -hmm. you know, uh, go to a number of other issues. But you, you know, it, it, there there are there's a mechanism for that kind of thing, to the extent that it's relevant to this request. Thank you. Mr. Wendt. Based on, on this presentation and the information that you know, I, I guess I'd like to ask the city administrator and the city attorney, do you stand by the recommendation or do you think that the recommendation that you made uh, is inappropriate? No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in because nobody else is going to. I've known about this project since last summer, and I've kept this confidential since last summer, specifically because I was requested to keep it confidential because of the nature and the sensitivity of who the potential client is. And uh, we say GSA, but it means to, means more than GSA. And, um, and I'm going to keep that confidence because I don't want this going out publicly until that announcement is due to be released by someone other than this city. It's not our job to release that information. So I won't do that. You know, I was comfortable with the lease as we discussed it on Friday <coughs> for an additional six years at a dollar. <coughs> I was, I'm still comfortable with the fact that whoever bears responsibility under the original 1991 lease that expires at year 39, but would be extended by six years, that we would correct the financial burden that the city incurred, which has been pointed out that, and this isn't the only time this has happened. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna put that out there as well. And we saw it, we researched it, we have invested significant staff time going back to 1991 all the way to today. I've spent more time on this, believe it or not, than many of the other items that we're working on. So I'm happy with the outcome about the six years for a dollar. I'm also happy with the outcome that, you know, this tenant, one of lessee, will pick up their responsibilities as defined inside this agreement, and that we will amend our agreement with quality construction that they entered into in 2019 because it flies in the face of the original lease in terms of who's responsible for what. So you've got a lot of moving parts here that through time have created this situation that we're confronting right now. You know, in terms of, you know, future lease lessees in that building, you know, I say good luck to that. I mean, it, it's just two, two empty floors. 
you know, and there's multiple empty floors in the Kone Tower, and there's empty floors probably even in that John Deere building that we don't know about. But I can tell you that they're empty because I've toured them. I've gone in them, and that's the biggest challenge we have. You know, I want to have the ability to work with not only this landlord of this building, but the other ones when the time comes to try and get businesses back in or adaptively reuse these buildings because, frankly, uh, the world changed. The world changed in the last 30, 30 years. You know, in the last three years, it changed dramatically. We're not going back. So, you know, as an economic developer, I'm all about incentives and inducements, always have been. You've seen my resume, you know. Those deals did not come about because I wasn't afraid to take big gambles, big risks. I'm willing to take that risk with Samco. I don't think Mr. Spiegel is going to walk away from the city. He could have. He chose not to. He chose to stay in Vest. He even located one of his employees, one of his star employees here, permanently to try and make this work for us. So, I mean, if he needs those extra six years based upon what, where we're at, I say we give it to him with the understanding that if we're going to change, you know, if there's going to be something else that needs to be done over there because we have other demands that come up three years from now, maybe, it takes time to develop residential or it takes time to, res to develop anything, you know, given today's economy. Um, there's nothing even in the works right now. So, you know, at this point, you know, I'm in favor of going forward with this. Um, I don't think uh, I don't think we're going to. Uh, you, know, you could ask for what you want, and I guess Mr. Spiegel could come back and reject it. That's 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 what I would say. So if we go with the amendment to the amendment, Mr. Spiegel can come back and say, "Nope, I'm out. I'm rejecting that. I don't want that deal." Um, that's he. That's his option. He doesn't have to agree. Or we can amend it. We can go with what was agreed to on Friday, and you know, and, and there you have it. Those are your choices. You got two choices: it's Friday's so, agreement or it's today's proposal. So I don't know which way. According to going. what you've said and what Roger has said, I would be interested in keeping the tenants we have now and not driving them away. Because it sounds like, it, like you said, it's a new world we're living in. It's going to be a hard time filling filling the building anyway. And when that place was built, Deer and Company, I think Deer and Company, they filled the whole place for I don't know how long until they got out of there. But, uh, we're not living in that world anymore, <laughs> for sure. So I, I, I can speak to one lease. I have full authority to disclose. That's my own. I mean, you know that uh, our law firm needed to relocate. It didn't really want to relocate, but needed to relocate. Could have gone anywhere, but this landlord is a straight shooter and has been fair to us. Now, our lease is 10 and 20. So, you know, you didn't do it, you didn't do it, you know, he didn't come back for for us as a full floor tenant, but he's he sees the desperation. Different times, just as your city administrator has identified. These are different times. We made our move in the throes of COVID, uh, you know, and and we didn't. It wouldn't have been the ideal time to do that. But other tenants have come after us, and, and he's been working to build the building. And so, you know, I I wouldn't have advocated for this, uh, you know, had the landlord not, you know, convinced me that uh, there was work to be done here. And right. so Thank there, there are going to be leases longer than the 2037. I don't sure. think anybody on this council disagrees with we want <clears throat> we want that place filled. Yeah, we want Absolutely. we want people downtown. We want to see pedestrian traffic downtown, and, and we we get it. You know when the mark has events and everything, but we want to see <laughs> that all the time. And if we have a concentrated place where we want new business and new firms to go in, it's downtown. That's why we had a TIF down there to begin with. We had to encourage growth. So. Thank you. All right. I think we need to round that conversation out unless there's anything else that's new. I, I just, but thank you, Your Honor. I just wanted to add, um, I, I had the tour. Um, 
and just by chance, within a week, I was part of a SCORE chapter meeting, and there was an individual there, one of the mentors, sharing pamphlets of the Heritage building so that the other mentors could share with uh, potential uh, individuals starting mm -hmm. businesses. So they're obviously doing their work beyond just talking to us, getting out there with potential business, um, uh, future businesses to fill some of the other spaces. So beyond just this floor, um, they're putting in the work. And that was just by chance that I happened to be at this meeting and uh, somebody else was promoting uh, the Heritage Building, which made me very happy to see. Thank you. All right, so we're prepared to vote on the amendment to the amendment that includes uh, the language about specific numbers of spaces. Uh, do you have that written down from what Margaret read out? Yes, I do. Could you just repeat it, please? Yeah. Um, Alderman Wendt, seconded by Alderman Moyer, I believe, moved to approve with the following additions. The lessee is and will be responsible for maintenance and extension of the lease will be limited to the number of spaces um, needed by the sixth floor tenant. Thank you. Roll call, please. Alderman Schmidt? Nay. Williams? Nay. Macias? Nay. Went? Aye. Timian? Nay. Moyer? Aye. O'Brien? Nay. Waldron? Nay. Schmidt? No, oh, I'm sorry. He is at large. <laughs> so, two I six nays. Thank you. So the amendment to the amendment fails. We're back to the amendment, which is the six-year extension with no other changes to the, the agreement. All right. Hearing no further discussion, roll call, please. Alderman Schmidt? Aye. Williams? Aye. Macias? Aye. Went? Nay. Timian? Aye. Moyer? Nay. O'Brien? Aye. Waldron? Aye. Six ayes, two nays. Okay, thank you. That motion passes as amended. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're to miscellaneous business. I will be, yes. Do we still need a motion to approve 1079-2222? As amended, that was just huh? on. No, that's oh, what we. Right. I thought oh, we were yes. just doing on the lease Thank you. itself. Nice catch. Thank you. Nicely done. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, all right, now we need the vote to approve the the agreement as amended. Motion to approve 1079 2022 as amended. Second. Thank you. Alderman Timian, followed by Alderman Macias. Roll call, please. Alderman Schmidt? Aye. Williams? Aye. Macias? Aye. Went? Aye. Timian? Aye. Moyer? Aye. O'Brien? Aye. Waldron? Aye. Eight ayes, no nays. Okay, thank you. That final, that it's all said and done now. <laughs> <laughs> Good pass. job. Okay. To miscellaneous business, uh, I think you will be happy to know today I attended the uh, Transportation Policy Committee of Bi State Regional Commission um, and the representative from it wasn't George Ryan, uh, was one of his associates, said that the bike, bike path will be open by the end of the week. That is correct. On the bridge. Ooh. So yay for, for that. Um, that the lighting on the eastbound side should be finished around late spring, early summer. So that's lovely. And the elevator on the other side in Bettendorf, uh, there, there'll be full lighting of that. And of course, the um, the demolition plans much later this year. Um, then we also got an update on um, the d organizations or the cities from around the bi-state region that had applied for the RAISE grants, which if you're not familiar with their cherished grants right now, um, and uh, happy to see there's a lot of variety in the Quad Cities for, for what <coughs> is being applied for. So I just wanted to give you that little update um, Mr. Moyer and I, he's up for the listening posts for second quarter, and we are working on date, a date to find. Uh, probably will make it more of a breakfast or lunchtime <laughs> thing to catch a different audience than the evening ones do. So that's what I have, Mr. Williams. Uh, amateur historian, Mr. Dave Koopman spoke to the Stevens Park group uh, on Sunday night at the Dear Wyman House, and he knew an awful lot about the area. 
and not only Stevens, but uh, for the rest of the city. So if you have a neighborhood group looking for someone to speak, um, <coughs> 45 minutes to an hour, and I think people stayed an <laughs> hour and a half, two hours afterwards picking his brain, but it was well worth it. And as always, very impressed with Mr. Strandland. Class act. Thank you. Mr. Macias. Uh, thank you. Just want to say that um, uh, the, this past week, we had a, a number of different concerts and events at the Tax Layer Center, and I actually had to, the chance to be at restaurants and, um, and also the ribbon cutting for Poor Brothers as well last Friday. Um, and it was just great to hear from everybody how happy they were that things are getting back to normal and um, just getting these acts here in the Quad Cities. I, over and over, I heard uh, people just thinking that it, it's some of the greatest things that that you could have here in our downtown. So people from all over the quantities, from other parts of other states were flocking in. Just so many people be, were commenting how great it was to have those events. And also Four Brothers, um, it was interesting. I had a conversation with one of the owners, how um, initially they were being asked to go to another city uh, elsewhere, not here in Moline, but they liked the downtown feel. They liked the community that um, the aspect that we have and that there's a realness that they appreciated and that that was also very good to hear so I wanted to share that uh, because it made me feel proud about Moline and I'm glad that they chose Moline and it, they have a great establishment and they did very well before the Snoop Dogg concert yes, as well. <laughs> so <laughs> I can imagine yes thank you that's right, it thank you yeah. Mr. Wendt uh, thank you honor um uh, I was reminded with the uh, <laughs> presentations earlier today with uh, keeping Moline beautiful uh, commission uh, that uh, a few years ago we had passed an ordinance that required at fast food or any place with a drive-through that they provide a trash can receptacle that was accessible from the car after you picked up your stuff because uh, if anybody has gone out and uh, picked up garbage along the uh, the roadways near those you know the KFC thing gets dumped out as they put the Chick-fil-A thing in or, or whatever it is. And so um, that is an ordinance that's been on the books. There was a time frame of, upon which uh, new ones had to put it in immediately, and there was a grandfather. Plenty of time for existing places to figure it out and put it in, and we are well past that time. And so I don't, if, do we need direction for, do we need to vote on this, or can we just ask staff to well, we're, we're actually enforce it? That'd be awesome, because yep. uh, we, we have these people who are spending hours a day cleaning up garbage. I mean, Rotary had their thing. I mean, it, it, we all do it all of the time, and these generators of it need to uh, be held accountable so that they, they do that. Um, next, uh, we're about a, the, the food licenses are due at the end of this month. And uh, a year ago, we had uh, um, had a conversation asking for some suggestions on how to uh, change our food license uh, ordinance. We have, a, we have a situation right now where like a place like Rascals Live, because they have an ice machine, uh, has the same food uh, license as Hy-Vee. I am really looking forward to our May, um, uh, uh, round conversation table. round table that we can maybe work on getting this but to all the food licensees out there that this didn't get uh, addressed this last year I, I apologize this should have been uh, addressed um, and with that uh, that's all I have here. just you can remind them we didn't have a health inspector so what is it all no good? we we contracted out to the oh yes the, that's true. so please don't no, say it, things like that that are completely inappropriate. That, you that the health in our, me, uh, no, th to, to to infer that the health that in in our city was negatively affected because we outsourced. Uh, That's to, not what I said. What I, it has much more to do with staffing. That's what I talked to about before, and we all know that the people we contracted out to. Uh, back, we're backed up with, with lots of things. That's why things weren't getting done. My point is, there's a full story, and we will get to fixing it as we can. Thank you for reminding um, us of the needs of our uh, food licensees. Sure. Anything further? No, you're not. Thank you. Mr. Timian. Uh, I just wanted to show gratitude for Public Works. Uh, they're already patching sidewalks. 
which uh, is great to see. You know, it's getting warm. And a big uh, gratitude to the residents of the Fourth Ward for letting me serve. Thank you. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh actually, real quick to, to Tony. Wait a second. Uh, thank you very much. There was a water main that uh, broke. I called him, and he had his guys out there in like 10 minutes uh, up the street. It's a street that probably needs to be uh, completely redone because it's potted. But, um, thank you very much for getting your crew out there so fast. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Moyer. Nothing for me, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. O'Brien. Oh, well, when I was at the Snoop concert. Yeah, me and Snoop are like that. Um, I went to the child advocacy breakfast this mm -hmm. morning, and it was uh, uh, a great event. Uh, Marcy, of course, did a great job, and uh, the guest speaker was really good. I can't remember her name, but uh, he, were you there? I know the chief was there. I saw Jenna Quinn. Je what was Jenna, Quinn. Jenna Quinn, great speaker. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm glad that the city was able to uh, give some money to child advocacy. I hope we can keep doing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Walton. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Last week at the Rock Island County Waste Management Agency meeting, <laughs> uh, I have to say Rickema, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Mike Davis, the son of either Marty or Mitch, I'm not sure which, came to the meeting and announced that Midland Davis will take recyclables. Uh, okay. So that was uh, big news. Um, he said it at the end of the meeting, so the rest of the board didn't get really a chance to talk about it. We did ask him one question, are you going to take it for the entire county? Yep. It doesn't have to necessarily be just Moline. So that was Great. wonderful news. Uh, I since contacted Mr. Schick for a follow-up. One thing is we all remember we put some money aside for an ARP money for, I think it was 85000 for a drop-off recycling. And uh, maybe some of that money, if it's legal, can be spent with them to do some advertising. And if we can't give money to a private firm like Midland Davis, maybe we can give it to Rickema and they can do it, I'm not sure. But Rod was gonna check with Carol Burns to make sure legally what we could do. Yeah. But I think it would be behoove us to work with them in a partnership to promote that and to get it out. So my meetings at Rickema will calm down. <laughs> yes. So when will they release details on how it's Well, that was work? the $400 question. He said, bring it now. See, they're willing to take they're it now. They're willing to take it without guidelines to the public? So, but it, is it only during... Uh, it's only office during their office hours. hours. Yeah, so it's only during their policy. So I would suggest, Mr. Vitas, if you could get Mr. Brecht on the gathering the details so we can make a sure. statement released to our public, that would be good. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? No. Thank you, Mr. Schmidt. <laughs> Yes, Your Honor. Uh, we last week uh, had the chance to review the first applications for the childhood, uh, child care grant program. Uh, we had those go through, and we have one who has been uh, granted the award. They're working through the final details on that, and one that was sent back with a few more questions, but I think will ultimately result in another uh, opportunity <coughs> for growth, both of them in home daycares, uh, who are also serving through uh, not just first shift uh, families. So. Uh, good to see as that's been a slow roll to that start, but we're starting to see those. There are a number of other applications in the pipeline, so just wanted to share that back. Uh, the committee was very, um, very aggressive in understanding what meets the criteria of the grant, what doesn't. You know, but these businesses really have a lot of needs that they're bringing to the table, far more than we can ever award them in a grant. And um, so seeing that opportunity of what we are able to help them with is a, a great, great way for us to move that forward. I want to also mention that that application was now put online as of last week, which is going to simplify the process for the many, many people who are interested in it. So that's helpful. Okay. Uh, Mr. Vitas, anything from you? Nothing to see. Me. Other staff? Okay. Then I believe uh, no further public comment. Okay. So we have executive session. Your Honor, I make a motion that the Council convene an executive session for the purpose of discussion of pending probable or imminent litigation 5 ILCS 120-2C11, employment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, dismissal of specific employees, 5 ILCS 120-2C1, 
and Property Acquisition 5 ILCS 120 slash 2 C5. Second. All right, motion by Alderman Williams, second by Alderman Went. Roll call, please. <laughs> Alderman Schmidt. Aye. Williams. Aye. Macias. Aye. Went. Aye. Timian. Aye. Moyer. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Waldron. Aye. Eight ayes, no nays. Your Honor, I need to not 